Magandang umaga mga kabano. Ako po si Chris Urbano and I am a chef here in the Philippines if you didn't already know that and today I'm going to give you the definitive guide for how to do adobo. Now this is obviously not a new recipe, it's not hard to find a lot of recipes but what I found on the internet when I, I ever search adobo is it's always you know somebody's particular style you know, of adobo, how they do their adobo. And this is one of the challenges with Philippine cooking, period, is that there's so much variation in how you can do particular dishes. So it's actually important not to necessarily le learn how to make somebody's type of adobo. You need to understand adobo, and you need to understand the history of adobo and where it comes from and how it has so many different types of varieties. So today I'm going to teach you how to make what I would consider and what most Filipinos would consider to be standard classic Filipino but then I'm going to talk you through also a number of the different variations of adobo and the many, many, many different ways that you can make this dish. Okay, now guys, you'll notice something a little bit different. I'm in a new kitchen today compared to some of the old recipes that I have done, right? And I'm actually in my home kitchen and I'm, I'm really in my home kitchen. You can tell because we've like made the set look really nice, but you see these tape here, this like red and yellow tape behind me. This is actually like a, a safety thing I do with my kids in my own kitchen because they, they actually come in here and the red zone means you can't touch this stuff or this is the hot zone of the kitchen. And then the yellow zone is like, you need to still watch out because there's a toaster and a kettle over here, but we don't do as much food preparation on this side. So kitchen safety is really a thing, especially if you want to start cooking with children. And that's how you know this is my real home kitchen that we're in. So the other thing you might notice is major level up. Na yung a aking mga gamit sa kusina. So I just wanted to do a shout out to Masflex who provided a lot of the cookware that you see in the kitchen. Thanks to them for helping me make this show and helping me take the message about how great Filipino food is to our cabanos around the world. So new kitchen, uh, new recipe or maybe old recipe, but a new way of doing it. I'm gonna show you many ways of cooking adobo today. Adobo really starts with a, a couple of very basic ingredients. Like a lot of Filipino cooking, yes, it's gonna start off with garlic and onion or bawang sibuyas. And I think like 80% of Filipino recipes would start off you know, with these couple of uh, ingredients. And I'm gonna today be giving you the recipe for what I would say is a standard household preparation of adobo in terms of the quantity, right? So we normally quantify around a one kilo of meat. So all of the measurements you're see, gonna see today are for a one kilo of meat uh, adobo. Okay, so I'm going to just start with a little bit of uh, oil. I will be sauteing first my uh, bawang sibuyas and also the pork that we're going to be using today to get the flavors out before we start adding in some of the liquid ingredients. My standard oil that I'm using with cooking at the moment is a blended canola and sunflower oil. Uh, you know, I like the high heat properties of the vegetable oils and also the bare uh, low in cholesterol compared to using palm oil. So I've just got a regular brown onion here. You can use any type of onion. I mean, you can put in red. I think typically with Filipino adobo, people would use a brown onion and normally for this recipe we would slice it into rings. Okay so we'll get that into our pan next. Okay so while those are simmering let's talk a little bit about the different types of meat that you can put into adobo right. So the classic adobo I believe huh, is going to be a pork based adobo. Now Filipinos will often adobo uh, chicken, they will do uh, adobo squid, like you can actually adobo anything. As I said earlier, it's not actually a recipe as much as it is a way of cooking, right? You know, it's almost like being uh, soup, like it's a genre of food almost, not a specific recipe where you have to have particular ingredients. You do have to have a couple of common things when you make adobo. So what you absolutely have to have is vinegar, peppercorns, bay leaves, and that's it. That's the only actual compulsory things in adobo. If you do those things, what you're gonna end up with is what we call adobo and pute, which if you're going, oh, that sounds like, you know, mapute and mapute and cooking. Yeah, it comes from white, like the white adobo. Pute is the root word for white. And that's the, probably the first type of adobo that was ever cooked in the Philippines. Bagoyong trade with China and Bagoyong panaan ng Castilla. So I'm um, sorry for the non-Filipino speakers, sometimes I'll drop into Tagalog, but before there was uh, an influence on the Philippine food from China and from Spain, you would just be cooking with vinegar here in the Philippines and it was a way to prolong the lifespan of the food. I think the nationally accepted form of adobo now would have soy sauce in it. That would be considered, I think, standard in the Philippines. It would be very unusual now to say a classic adobo did not have soy sauce. So I would kind of consider that that is also a compulsory uh, ingredient. Now, when it comes to the meats, you have 
pork, which I believe is the, the classic and most standard. The second most used meat in the Philippines would be chicken, and sometimes Filipinos will uh, combine them into what we call the CPA, which is the chicken pork adobo, right? And you mix bits of chicken, so usually wings and drumsticks, um, and then you would have bits of uh, pork cut into, you know, quite large chunks like I've got here and you would mix those together. So those are the types of meat that you would typically use, but you know, you can put a dobon pusit, which would be squid. I consider that to be a slightly different recipe because you're starting to use usually um, chilies and tomatoes when you cook that. So when it comes to like a standard preparation of a dobo, this is typically the meat you're going to use. So the type of pork that we would normally use when cooking a dobo, it's usually going to be the kasim, which is the like the pork rump, and it's just chopped into quite big cubes. And in the Philippines, it's known as adobo cut. So if you're a Filipino, you obviously know to ask for adobo cut, but most butchers won't know what that is. So you can tell them that you want sort of, I guess, large chunks of the pork butt or the pork rump. Now, sometimes Filipinos will use different cuts. You can do it with liempo, for example. There's no rule on the type of meat you use, but I find this is the, probably the most often used. And, you know, this is a cut that does benefit from a long simmer time to tenderize it. So one that you're going to simmer off in adobo for a while, it, it's, it's not a bad choice. Um, and save your liempo for other dishes uh, or just grill it. And liempo for the non-Filipino speakers is of course uh, the pork belly, so it's a high fat uh, type of meat. So let me show you what the typical adobo meat looks like. There's a piece of it here and you'll see that it still has the skin on it, it still has the uh, taba or the, the light layer of fat between the skin and the meat. And you know they say in cooking that fat is flavor, right? So adobo is a very flavorsome dish in part because the fat's still on the meat. So let's get these in now. Okay, so at this point I've just added in my, uh, my pork uh, into the hot pan and we're gonna sear this. I just wanna get it browned all over. That's really about bringing out some of the flavors and developing some of, you know when you sear, you bring out a different flavor to the, the meat, the more savory, that, those slight bitter notes from the exterior searing. That's, that's why we do this before we add in the liquid sauces and just boil it. It will contribute to the savory flavor. When people ask like, you know, what is Filipino food and what are sort of the iconic dishes of the Philippines, I think that probably 60-70% of Filipinos would give you the answer that it's adobo. There is some debate over what is the national dish though, it's not that clear in the Philippines. So if you're from uh, different parts of uh, the country, you might say that the national dish is actually something like sinigang, which is the Philippine sour soup. And that's one of the interesting things about Filipinos, it's not a consensus of what is the national dish, the way I think in you know Italy it's like it's pretty clearly pizza and pasta. If you're in Japan, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure it would be like sushi, uh, ramen, sashimi, right? There's some clear iconic dishes. And that's actually part of the, I guess, why Filipino food is different is that there is this really high degree of variation uh, even between regions of the Philippines that we can't agree as a country or society on an all national dish not in. And one of these debates that's going on is, is adobo the national dish or is sinigang the national dish of the Philippines? You know, now people have asked me in the past where I weigh in on that and I probably say I believe it's adobo and partly I believe it's that because I think it's the dish that the Philippines is best known for outside of the Philippines by foreigners at the moment. So apparently the Philippine Congress also agrees with me and that there is some moves underway at the moment to officially recognize adobo as the national dish of the Philippines. But it's interesting because even if it does end up as the official national dish, right? I'm not sure it's like that representative of all of the food that is in the Philippines because there is just such a high variety. I mean, it's nothing like things like sinigang or the many types of noodle-based dishes here in the Philippines or the many types of coconut-based curries that are here in the Philippines. Like we actually have such a variety of, you know, food genres to Filipinas that it, it's really hard to say that adobo is iconic or representative of the wider Filipino diet. That said, you, at some point you just have to decide and I think it's a pretty, pretty good choice. Here is what my uh, pork is now looking like. Like this is what I consider to be a nice level of searing and caramelization. Just where it's starting to get lightly browned, a few patches where it's darker from the heat and that's where your, those savory notes are really going to come out of the meat. So this is the point where I would start to add in some of my uh, pang palasa, my flavoring agents that we're going to be using for adobo today. For a kilo of meat, I'm going to be using half a cup of vinegar. We're using uh, ordinary cane vinegar today. I do make a habit of using cane vinegar in the Philippines. You can get those really cheap vinegars, but they taste like soap. When it's like just white industrial vinegar, you can use that, but I just 
whenever I taste the vinegar, I'm like, mm, something's not right here. So I like to use a natural cane vinegar when I'm doing uh, any kind of Filipino cooking. And why not, right? This uh, you know, sugar cane country is plenty of cane vinegar going, and it's very inexpensive, you know, to be honest. Only a few pesos more than the, the factory stuff. Okay, so next I'm going to get some whole peppercorns. I'm going to use about half a tablespoon, probably about 20 or 30 pieces. Okay, so that's going into the pan. And then I'm going to put in a few bay leaves, laurel. Now at this point, if I add in some water, so if I added in half a cup of water and then simmered this, I would have what we call adobo pute, right? The white adobo. To my knowledge and research, and I have recently written a book on this topic where I had to really research the historical origins of Filipino food, this is the sort of original like pre-soy sauce being in the Philippines, how it was probably cooked. And this form of cooking in vinegar in the Philippines did predate both trade with China and also the Spanish uh, colonial period. So even though the name adobo sounds like the dish uh, has Spanish origins, Filipinos were cooking with vinegar and peppercorn and, and bay leaf like this before the Spanish arrived. You know, adobo, it almost makes it sound like they were using like wine vinegar or something. It feels like a very Spanish sounding name. So it is believed that the Spanish didn't invent adobo or bring adobo to the Philippines, but rather that name was probably labeled to the dish that the Philippines were also cooking. And I'm not sure what they would have called it before the Spanish arrival, but that seems to me a plausible explanation for why the name adobo happened. And that happened with a lot of things at the time, like, you know, there was uh, Chinese noodles were being prepared here, you know, and that was called panse. And then the Spanish came in and made all of the noodle houses, became known as panceteria, which is a very sort of Spanish way of labeling Chinese noodle shop. When when you have a, a colonial power come in, they may get a lot of credit for the names of foods, but actually that food might have just been there before, but they gave it a new name. Arroz caldo comes to mind as well. I'm like, that sounds very Spanish, like literally rice cooked in a pot in Spanish, like arroz and caldo. But you know, in the Philippines, we would call that lugao, and in China that was congee, right? So did the Spanish invent arroz caldo? I don't think so. Okay, so that is the white adobo we've got going there at the moment. Now, I'm not gonna stop at this point because I said I'm gonna show you how to do adobo in full. I'm just giving it a bit of time to simmer. The longer you can simmer in vinegar, the better, because you know this obviously is what preserves meat long-term, and that was why adobo is such a popular dish, it's something that you can cook and you can actually leave out at room temperature for an extended period without the food uh, spoiling. And one trick is if you want to do something really, really delicious that's not very healthy for you, you can actually take a dobon pote and then you refry this in hot oil, like you shallow fry it and you crisp it up and that is amazing. I recommend trying that at least once in your life, but not twice in your life, but it's really good. What we need to do bring in next is our soy sauce. So soy sauce came to the Philippines via the uh, trade with China and probably, you know, around 1200, 1300, 1400 AD. There is actually evidence of trade with China and the Philippines dating back centuries. Soy sauce is one of the products that has come into the Philippines via China and it's one of the Chinese culinary influences on this cuisine. So I'm going to put my soy sauce in next and I've got half a cup of that also. And you see immediately this starts to look like the adobo that you probably know because it gets that nice brown caramel color from the soy sauce. And I'm then going to add in one cup of water. Now, why do you put the water? One is that you actually, to cook a kilo of pork, you need at least sort of half a liter of liquid in there, right? So if you just have half a cup each of soy and vinegar, it won't be enough to really cover the pork. But if you use only soy and vinegar, the flavors will be too concentrated. I mean, the whole cup of soy sauce, that's a lot of flavor, right? And likewise with vinegar, it's a very high degree of sourness. So we are diluting it as well, because if you just tried to use these two ingredients solely, you would find that you created something that was not palatable due to extreme levels of the flavor. Now, every Filipino will have a slightly different ratio of soy to vinegar. Uh, when I quantify this myself and what I consider to be classic standard Filipino adobo, I do a 50-50 ratio, so half cup soy, half cup vinegar, one cup water. That's my standard recipe for a kilo of adobo, but depending on palate more, some Filipinos would prefer it to be slightly more sour, in which case they'll up the vinegar ratio and some would prefer it to be more salty. And really that's up to you, right? And what your family prefers, that's some of the variations you can do. You know, in, in my household, for example, uh, I've actually even made a Vegemite adobo, um, where instead of using soy sauce, I use Australian Vegemite because I'm an Australian, sort of a yeast, very salty based product uh, that we put on bread for breakfast. 
and I actually use it as a substitute for the, the, the soy. And, and we actually have, a, I think, a link to that. Uh, we'll put the link to that video here if you want to take a look at that. It was one of my very old first recipes. So, you know, the production quality is not very good, but do have a look at it. And the, the adobo looks like it gets like more glistening and sticky because of the, the use of the Vegemite. What I've now got here is what I would say is the classic standard adobo. Simmer this for 20 minutes, let some of the, the fat start to release from the meat and the fat that's around it, and you've got yourself a dog bar. Like, it'll reduce a little bit. That's it, like at this stage, 20 minutes, walk away, come back, you got a dog bar, right? But, where's the fun in that? I want to talk to you a little bit about all the different ways you can extend it. So, while this is boiling, the first one I'll talk about is uh, the use of eggs. Now, eggs is obviously, this is another form of protein, so, you know, if, if your goal is to get more vegetables into your dish, you're not really going to solve that problem. You're just kind of adding more protein, but a different type of protein. And I actually really like eggs in adobo. There's something about the salt, sour and egg combination that works really, really, really well. So I, I like it from a flavor standpoint. And if I'm, if I'm making adobo at home, I almost certainly put in boiled eggs. Also, so there's a variety. So you have like one, two bits of pork and usually one boiled egg with my uh, adobo. That, that's a really favorite combination of mine. We're gonna get a few eggs going. I'm gonna boil them over here. Okay, so one of the first extenders that we're gonna put in is a potato. Now, I, I actually really like potato in adobo. It takes on a great texture and flavor. Normally this will just go in in chunks. Usually the chunks will be a little bit smaller than the meat itself. So we're looking at about that size for the potatoes. Okay, now just stir that through. And you know, the good thing about when you put the potatoes in, right, is that their cooking time is about the same as the simmering time for the adobo, so it doesn't really cost you any additional time. You're going to be simmering for, you know, 20 to 30 minutes anyway, so might as well throw in a handful or two of potatoes, right, and extend your dish and, you know, get a, have a little bit less meat on your plate. Now, this one I'll probably also put my eggs into once they finish boiling, and in the meantime, I'm just going to transfer this pan to my other stove and I'm going to make a separate type of adobo over here. Okay, so another variation on adobo you might want to try. This is uh, ubod. Outside of the Philippines, this is not particularly well known as an ingredient, but this is actually the, what we would call in English the heart of palm. So a palm tree, uh, there's the growing bud of it. So it's like the young shoot of a palm. Because it's actually a, a part of a, a tree, right? It absorbs the adobo sauce really, really well. You're not just cooking it in there, it's like actually will just suck up all of the, um, the flavor, the, the soy vinegar flavor. So it ends up tasting almost exactly like what the adobo tastes like. And it just adds, you know, vegetable bulk to uh, the adobo, but quite in a, quite a tasty way, it just absorbs the flavor of what it's being cooked in. So my adobo over here, I'm gonna add some of this ubud in. And this cooking time, it'll be similar, you know, also about 20 minutes. Um, similar to the potatoes. So we've got our two styles of adobo going at the moment. These just need to simmer for a few more minutes, probably another 10 minutes or so. But you know, I said earlier, I, I really find it hard when eating Filipino food not to have some vegetables on my plate. And one of, I think, the shortcomings of adobo is unless you put some extenders in, you don't really have any actual vegetables with your ulam at all. So you need to prepare some kind of veggies on the side. Now, I often find with adobo, because it's a very strongly flavored dish, that I'm just looking for something very, very simple to, you know, pair with it, you know, in terms of vegetables. So I'll often just go with some steamed kangkung or pechai. Now, I actually don't have any. I forgot to buy this morning at the market when preparing for the show. But fortunately, I think some of you guys know I have a garden on my rooftop here in Makati City. So I'm actually going to show you my garden right now. And we're going to go and get some kangkung. All right, so let's go. Hi guys, so welcome to my garden. Uh, we actually have done a video about this before, about the different th types of things you can grow in Metro Manila. Sita works pretty well, Ampalaya works pretty well. And we also find that uh, leaf 
leafy greens like pechay and kangkong actually work really well in the urban environment. Because hindi kailangan mo ng babuyog, right? You don't need bees to do pollination when you're eating the leaves of the plant. So we find that those uh, le leafy greens actually go pretty well. It's very hot up here though. Up here it's like 11 or 12 o'clock, uh, middle of the day, it's hot. So anyway, have a little look around. Uh, we'll show you some of the plants and there's a video here you can check out. Today I'm going to go in and pick some of this kangkong that's growing here. So there it is, it's a beautiful bunch of kangkong. And you know, what I love about this, I mean, just, just clean, fresh, nothing gets fresher than picking your own, right? So this is gonna be absolutely delicious as a side to our adobo. While I've been upstairs getting my, uh, harvesting my kangkong in the Maputin cooking garden, my eggs are finished boiling. I just quickly shelled those off the camera, but I'm just gonna pop these in. I like to use those smaller native chicken eggs. They don't look particularly big, but I think it's actually just a nice size for um, when you're having it with a dough bowl. I don't wanna use like giant eggs. And you can actually use quail eggs. That's another variation on a dough bowl, is to use the, the quail eggs, which are you know even smaller again. If you can't find either, then any egg will work, of course. And they're really just going to, you can just throw them in at the end for a couple of minutes, mainly to just warm up and get coated in the adobo sauce. So that is starting to look very, very, very good. Now, obviously, because I really want to have some vegetables with my cooking, so I'll just go through and check that there's nothing too pang it. Obviously, when you're using homegrown, I mean, you know, you see some bits of yellowing there where it might be that the water supply wasn't uh, as constant as it could be, but I love homegrown vegetables because they look like real vegetables, you know, real vegetables don't look perfect. Just cut that broadly in half. I do like to get the stems in with the kangkong, especially if we're going to boil it. This is all uh, good for you. Some people just like to really pick out the leaves only. I'm just gonna simply do a, a boil on these. You can also steam it, but um, I've got some, some hot water here and it's actually faster to, to boil than to, to steam. If you think about with steam, you've got to get it to the boil first. It's gonna take a few more minutes. So I just wanna do this very, very, very quickly. And we're not gonna need long at all for the kangkong. So this is already pretty close to the boil. And if you're wondering, I have a different pot here. This is Masterflex. Galaxy series, I think they sell this one online. It has slightly thicker aluminum, so better for the sort of you know heat retention properties. It's actually quite a thick aluminum, the edges and the base. All right, so I'm just gonna go straight in with my kung kung now that that water's boiling. And you know what I love about cooking kung kung is, so one, obviously it's super healthy, like it's, it's green and it's really good for you, but it's like no matter how much you have, you always think it's like a crazy amount of kung kung, but when you cook it, it just really boils down. And the more you can eat of it, the better. So never think you have too much kung kung. Like the bigger the bunch of kung kung you use, the better. And this is nearly done already. Like that's probably 45 seconds. Okay, so just like that, it's done. Like 60, 90 seconds. And I have a beautiful bowl of kung kung that I can serve on the side of my adobo. If you want a tiny bit of flavor and you can't bear to have it without some seasoning, I'll just do a tiny bit of oil an even tinier amount of soy sauce. It's probably like half a teaspoon. So I'm just gonna toss those through and I'll taste it again now. Amazing. It is a huge difference between that and store-bought kangkong. You know, store-bought kangkong always looks tired, wilted. A lot of the flavors come out. Here you're just like, wow, spinach actually tastes pretty good. Like, just with that simple seasoning, that's it. That's delicious. Okay, so show time here. I've, uh, I've cooked my adobo, and I'm gonna do something a little bit, maybe slightly controversial here. I'm going to add my own new variant to adobo, because remember, there are no rules in Filipino cooking. So I'm going to actually show you now what I am going to call the royal adobo. So now I literally have everything in my adobo. I've got uh, three types of extenders in there. I've got the ubod, the potatoes, the eggs, and there you have it, Mount Cabana, wherever you're watching in the world, Chris Urbano's Royal Adobo uh, and fresh steamed Kung Kung. Okay guys, so tasting time. I, I know already you guys are gonna be leaving comments like Urbano, where's your rice? Sanyong kanin mo. Sorry, I forgot to cook rice. I was too concerned with showing you guys how to make really, really good adobo. So I might just get myself, here we go, I got, uh, I'll get this one to make taba. Because meron din akong taba, no? Everyone's telling me how malusog I'm looking at the moment, which is great. That's probably because I'm eating too much adobo. So I've got some of this on, I'll get a little bit more of the, uh, the ubud. 
Now, I actually started a kitchen canteen recently at the office for my, my team and, and obviously adobo is one of the dishes we do because it's quite easy to make it in very big quantities and we were just doing a simple pork adobo without all of the additions. We'll put potato in it as the extender. So good. Sorry, I was going to talk about the food before I put it in my mouth, but once you get adobo on your fork, it's hard not to eat it straight away. So, you know, what's going on when you have adobo, right? The, the food pairings that you're doing here is really salty, sour, savory, those three, right? Of all of the types of flavor sensation, this is salt, sour, and savory all together. But I need more sauce and I need rice. I want to make it more soupy. So the egg is just great because it's just like a different type of protein, but egg is sort of, but I mean, it always makes you feel you know, if you're sick, egg is one of those things that feels like regenerative. I think that's what I like about it in adobo. Like it's still savory like the pork, but it just has that feeling like the comfort food feeling. I think is what you get when you add egg. It's a more comfort dish. And now I'm going to get some of the meat with the taba on it, which will be the most flavorsome part. So there, that piece that's like, that's mostly taba. Wow. So the flavor is just intense when you get the fattier part. And then we have the potato, and who doesn't love potato? That makes it really comfort food as well. The egg and the potato just make it like a comfort food dish. Okay, so sorry I took too big a bite there. Again, my eyes are too big for my stomach, and I have to keep telling you guys how it tastes while I'm eating the food. So one of the things people ask me a lot about adobo, they're like, hey Urbano, you know, you have a wine business, you're into pairing wine, you know everything about wine. So how do you pair wine with adobo, right? And my answer typically is, in this preparation, with a fair bit of vinegar in it, it's actually quite hard to pair wine successfully to adobo, right? Wine, if you have a dish that's very high on vinegar, that's one of, or very sour, that's one of the hardest things to successfully pair with wine. The high acidity in the food will make the wine taste really flat and lifeless because the acidity here is higher. So, you know, your mouth is actually wants things that, that balance it out. So I have done it a few times and then, you know, I would probably have it with something like a, a Tempranillo wine, um, a Sangiovese, like something that does well with, you know, pork meat. Um, but you have to lower the vinegar, it's just gonna be a mess. The cool thing about pairing them is obviously the sauce from the adobo runs into the kangkung, so you kind of get adobo and kangkung anyway. It's like a two for one dish, you don't have to cook it specifically. And while I finish this, actually, I wanna start talking to you guys a bit more like when I'm pacing the food, because I get a lot of comments on this show and it's hard to find time to make vlogs to go back to you. So I, um, I printed off some of your questions and comments and you know, I thought we can go through a few of these while I uh, am tasting the food. Okay, so first question I've got today comes from Rex who says, I like your thinking, I'm a Canadian Filipino and I'm trying to fuse Western and Filipino food. Any suggestion on how to cut the fat and keep the flavor? Wow, it's almost as if I paid you to write that question, right? That's like my entire advocacy with this channel. You know, how to do fusion and how to make Filipino food really great. So um, look, a lot of Filipino meats are high fat. This adobo is a classic example of it. I mentioned earlier in the episode, you know, one of the, the, the tricks you can use if you're cooking with pork in particular is you cook the dish, you refrigerate the dish, and all the saturated fat that came out during the cooking process, you scrape out, you throw it in the bin. Now, that will get the fat out, but it will also get rid of some of the flavor because that is actually what is driving a lot of the flavor in adobo and what makes it so delicious is the sauce is actually carrying a lot of saturated fats that are, are now in sort of a liquid state when you heat. So that makes adobo delicious and you will compromise on flavor if you do that. So I find it hard in the pork dishes and, I, and I've taken that approach with a few things. Some of the pastas I make, especially longanisa based pasta sauces, you know, I'll often do that um, or I'll look for sort of, I guess, a less fatty longanisa and you can cook in that or you can actually just get rid of most of it and replace it with a little bit of olive oil. Okay, so those are some of the ways you can reduce the fat, but I think you would be compromising on the flavors. So what I would suggest is that you actually consider how to use Filipino ingredients that are inherently healthier to begin with. And what I'm talking about there is Philippine seafood and fruits, right? You can't really argue with the seafood and, and fruits. The seafood is inherently very lean. There's not a lot of fat on uh, any of the seafood. Uh, and of course, fruits themselves are usually pretty good for you. I mean, arguably, some of the Philippine fruits are very, very, very sweet. And there are good, better fruits. And some fruits are better for you than others. But I think overall, if you can focus on the, using those type of ingredients, you're going to be better off. And an example of a fusion dish I've done, which really draws on those type of ingredients, would be uh, like my tuna mango and bitter gourd salad, right? And that's really a combination of getting some gensan tuna, searing it, 
and then tossing that through with you know fresh chopped tomatoes, a little bit of um, onion leeks, and then some salted bitter melon that's been salted, so it's not quite so bitter. And then offsetting that with, with Philippine mangoes, right? Either the Indian mangoes or the sweet mangoes or halo halo ng dalawang klase ng mango. So that's the kind of direction I've been heading in in order to get Filipino food or Filipino flavors that are more healthy is to just choose my ingredients, choose things inspired, but then not be bound by the, I guess, the Philippine cookbook when it comes to how to actually prepare them and make my own decisions on how to combine the ingredients into new things. And you can do the same, Cabano. So great question. Thanks for watching. And uh, if you actually make anything that's uh, Canadian, Filipino fusion, please send it through to the Facebook page. My Maputin Cooking Facebook page, we love to share it out, show some of our other cabanos around the world what you're doing. Potato time. Okay, so next is Shay Malin who writes, Hi for beginners, is there any kind of soil that I can use? Thanks. So I, I assume you're referring to growing vegetables up on your rooftop in the Philippines. So, you know, look, soil, there's lots of different types of soil. So typically you have to work with what you have first point, right? I think for most households, it's not really practical to go out and like source a particular soil from a particular location. Like you just got to work with what's available locally. So there's different types of soil like clay or loam or like more sandy, you know, and you can just Google this online to see all the different classifications of soil. What I find more important though is what you do with your soil and how you improve your soil over time, right? So obviously you can't have a soil that's just like clay only but it is nice to have a bit of clay mixed in so I normally find if I've got a soil that is really clay like I'll try to find a different soil that is more sandy and mix the two together then you want to start blending in organic material uh, whether that's compost or you know kitchen waste that has broken down into a into a humus whatever it is and you mix that through the soil and you're looking to get this kind of rich black earthy smelling soil over time and it can take you weeks or months to build up the soil that way particularly if you try and do it organically just using kitchen scraps now if you are a house household gardener, what do you do, right? Where are you even going to mix up that compost? So here you've got to consider also whether you're going to go with organic fertilizers, whether you're going to go with chemical fertilizers, which I don't generally advocate, but I feel like if you're in a household environment, it's very hard. Like you can just put a few pellets of, you know, the, the plant food on and your plants are going to grow better. If you don't, you've got to have a system to put organic material in and that's hard to do in an apartment in Manila. I'm looking at vermiculture just for reference, because I think that is something you can do in a, in a kitchen or in, a, in an apartment building and then just use the worm, you know, uh, droppings and waste and worm tea that comes out to, to fertilize the garden. So yeah, think about whatever source soil you can get. Sometimes you combine different types of soil to get the right combination and then you've got to keep your soil rich over time if you want to get a good harvest. Okay, next question comes from, I love this Chris question, how long can I store the leftovers? This was for lechon sauce. So this is a question about lechon sauce came from my video here, I'll put the link up. This was like the most rich lechon sauce in the world, like where you put so much liver in there, it wasn't funny, delicious, it was, it was almost like liquid pate. So try it out, it's very tasty. Now how long can you keep the leftovers for that? Well technically speaking, at that point you have a liver sauce, right? And liver sauce has vinegar in it which will preserve it. This is one where I don't know a specific day count that you could keep it. I would keep it in, in the refrigerator and every time I pulled it out, I think at least a week would be fine. After a week, I would be at least smelling and tasting it before consuming any more and just being careful. But when you consider it, as long as you ran a hygienic process in the preparation, you could technically bottle that and probably top it off with a little bit of oil or something inside a clean, sterilized bottle and keep it for weeks or months, right? You know, there's no reason why what you make at home is any different to the liver sauce you buy in a store-bought bottle. Now, they'll use some chemical preservatives on theirs to keep it pristine and, and food safe for a long time. You could also do the same thing but you know, I would say this is one where if you really know what you're doing, then you could bottle it, jar it, sell it, whatever, make a huge batches, keep them for months. If you don't know what you're doing, I would say make it, use it, and whatever leftovers you have, keep it in the fridge and just check on the, check on it before you use that it doesn't taste wrong. And if you taste something and it's slightly funny, just or on the side of throwing it out. I've learned that the hard way, you know, food poisoning in pretty much every continent because I sometimes didn't listen to my palate and was like obsessed with getting that traditional wet market experience. <laughs> and if you get a traditional wet market experience, you also often get a traditional bathroom experience afterwards, which I've done. So <laughs> if, you're, if your tongue's telling you no, just, just say no. Okay, so my next question. I like this one, it's an interesting one. So what I don't get about vegans is that they don't want to consume products by killing or hurting animals, but how can you produce vegetables without killing its pests? Interesting question. And besides, meat tastes awesome. <laughs> but I love vegetables too. Okay, so I, I thought I'd read that question out because I'm literally sitting here in front of 
plate of meat and a plate of vegetables. And I think the question is, which one of these is more hurtful to animals? Now, interestingly, I agree with you that in most factory vegetable farming techniques, they are using a lot of chemical pesticides in order to control pests. And I agree with you that I don't think we should be like a cow is somehow superior to, you know, a beetle, right? Like they are all life forms. Are we really going to say that one has got more right to not be hurt or killed than another. And I actually see all of them, you know, I believe the human is an omnivore. I believe it's okay to eat meat. I, I do believe that there are other animals who are carnivores. I think we are omnivores and then there are creatures who are herbivores, right? So I'm fine with all of that. But I would say that this particular kankulm here is actually no animals were hurt in the making of this kankulm because I know that because it came from my garden and I don't use pesticides. So what I picked earlier is definitely a pesticide-free, completely 100% organic, homegrown kong kong that did not hurt anybody. So I think there is options to eat vegetables genuinely without harming animals. And um, I think increasingly people are getting interested in those organic farm techniques where you use sort of natural techniques to control. So, you know, when I was in Australia, we used to use like perithium to control for white cabbage moth, for example. Sorry, this is a bit technical gardening speak, but perithium is sort of a type of flower. You extract the flower of essence you make a sort of a tea with it. That's an organic way of controlling for certain pests, you know, and white cabbage moth is still my enemy to today. I mean, I literally left Australia because of that. Like, I just couldn't grow a cabbage. Just couldn't grow a cabbage without them ruining it. So there are ways to sort of control with something natural and they're more like keep the bugs away as opposed to kill them. So it's not like one or the other, I guess what I'm saying. You can buy vegetables that are genuinely have not harmed an animal. But I think it's a really interesting point for the vegans out there, which is you have to consider probably the entire part of your food supply chain. And if whatever you're eating as a, as a vegan, it's possible that if you're there for the cruelty values or like being against cruelty to animals, how are you sure that even though you're not eating meat, there's other things that you eat that might have an impact to animals as well. Or it might be that the way that that vegetable is grown, like you're into tofu and soy, well is that soy being grown at the expense of the habitat of some animal that's been cleared so that they could grow soybeans so you could have your tofu, right? And I think that's an important point to consider. And likewise, if your position is anti-cruelty of animals, there are probably meats out there that are produced in a sustainable way where, you know, it's a um, ethical or pain-free pain killing when it comes to the animal or it's a natural hunted or something like that. So these are all things that you consider and I think ultimately everybody's got to reach their own view on their values, but it's an interesting question. And the last one I'm gonna to take today is, Chris, are you gonna start a culinary school here in the Philippines? So maybe, I mean, I like to think that my putin cooking and my cookbook that is about to come out is actually kind of that culinary school that you're asking for. Like right now, the best part is it's free. All I ask you to do is click the subscribe button <laughs> and the like button and the share and tell your friends call to actions that we share out in the channel because that's actually how I can keep making the show is the more people who watch it then we're able to actually make some money and pay for the team because right now you just see me on this camera there's three other people in this room who you can't see who actually help me make the show right and how we actually give them a job and a livelihood to help keep helping me make the show that's actually we've got to make some money from this this program in order to keep doing it so right now it is a culinary school it's free and I just ask that you tell your friends about it. Now, would I go into a formal training program at some point? Possibly I would, but I think that the thing that I do that's really valuable to Filipino cooking is not showing people how to hold a knife because there are plenty of culinary institutes who will teach you that, you know, or how to boil water or, or make pasta or cook an egg. You can learn that anywhere, but I think what a culinary school won't teach you is the ins and outs and the intricacies and the history of Filipino food, right? And that's where, where my specialization is. So for me, there's a question, do I need an actual culinary school to teach that? Or can I do that through a program like this but you learn how to cook an egg and hold a knife at a generic culinary school. That's sort of the thing in my mind. The other thing is that I'm really busy. <laughs> so we may or may not do the culinary school, but I think every week you can tune in here, you can see new episodes on how we cook Filipino food well. And there's nothing wrong with teaching yourself how to cook from YouTube, right? I think it's a legitimate way of learning a skill. And that's why there's so many how-to videos, not just in cooking, but everything, right? So on that note, guys, I wanna thank you for joining me today. It's been a really fun day of cooking for me. I I hope that you have learned something valuable. We've gone through all the ins and outs of how to do a dough roll, lots of different variations, the history of the food and the cuisine. We've tasted it, we've told you how it tastes, we've told you how to bring different flavors and textures into your dough roll. So if there is anything at all that you now are still wondering about a dough roll that I did not cover in this video, please leave a comment below. I think I covered everything, but if I haven't, I'm here to ask you questions about it. Do leave a comment either way. 
do share and tell your friends because that's the only way the show gets out. And of course, you know, maraming salamat po sa inyong papanood. Ako po si Chris Urbano, your Filipino chef and guide to this great world cuisine. Drop me a line anytime, guys. Um, check us out at Facebook and Instagram as well. I'm Chris Urbano. I'll see you next time. Bye now.